You hear? As you all well know, how many of you, as you were kind of moving around and doing your thing the last couple of days, thought about the Passover and about our Lord giving his life for us this, you know, past Friday, they call it Good Friday, and then, uh, of course, tomorrow, what happens? Resurrection, the resurrection. So, um, in putting this message together, I was impressed by the Lord to continue on. We talked last Sabbath about what? Who can remember, if any? Three what? Three gardens. Garden of Eden, right? And then we had the Garden of Gethsemane. And there was a third garden. The Garden of Golgotha, where Christ was crucified. And just below where he was crucified was a garden. And that's where Mary came. She came to the garden, you know, to the tomb, to, you know, on the, Sabbath, on the uh, first day of the week, Sunday. And he wasn't there. And she thought, who took him? The gardener. She thought he was the gardener. You know, when she finally saw him, where did you put my Lord, you know? Uh, and then we talked also about three other things. The three trees. We talked about the tree of knowledge, good and evil. We talked about the tree of life. But there was a third tree. And that tree ended up right in between those two trees. And usurped both of those over, you know, just took over. And that's the cross of Christ was the tree. He was crucified on a tree. So, uh, Garden of the Heart, that, that phrase just kind of popped into my mind for some reason. And I know why, because the Lord wanted to point this out. Because ultimately, you know, I love gardening. How many of you love gardening? I, I love just kicking around outside. You know, I planted some, some, uh, some flowers just this last week. Uh, watching everything bud and bloom. I don't know, does it, it kind of just, it does something for you. It, I, I just, I love it and it just lifts me up and it, it inspires me. It reminds me of Christ's resurrection. Power. Because none of that would be happening without his power to make that happen. But ultimately, the, the greatest power that he wants to be, have sway over is our hearts. Our hearts. And it's a heart work that is constantly going on. Constantly. And he never gives up. He keeps working and working. You know, it's not easy being a gardener. <laughs> uh, I almost got hired on to help do that kind of work. And I, I did it one day and he really worked me hard. So hard, I didn't go back. <laughs> uh, I, I said, you know, I, I, I'm too old. I, 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 you know, I, I'm trying to keep up with this young whippersnapper, and he was, he was leaving me in the dust. <laughs> and I was just helping him up, and I came home dragging, just dragging. But uh, this parable is interesting. This, you know, he loved telling stories. He loved, you, you know, using parables. He was a teacher. He was a rabbi. My mother reminded me not too long ago. She said, Jim, did you know that your great-great-grandfather was a rabbi? I said, what? She said, yeah, he was a rabbi. He lived in Russia, and then he came over here, and he was a rabbi. And I said, oh, okay, then maybe that's where I get it from. Because, you know, I, I, I've you know, been a teacher many years. And I said, okay, that's interesting. And I think she even told me that, did you say I resembled him? Two? Yes? Yeah. I even look like him. So, woo. Plus, so you can in, in, you know, illustrate uh, this. I, I have Jesus standing there as he's giving this parable on, of all things, a boat. He must have had a good balance. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Because, you know, being there on the boat at, on the seashore, because the multitudes were so great. But leading up to this, you know, 
on that self same day he was being attacked very fiercely by the, the Pharisees and they were just on his case wearing, trying to wear him down and then just before this this parable that he's giving to the multitude his own family comes to him and tries to say you know we're, we're your family we're, we're the really important ones here and his response back to them was look out there see all these people they're my mother, they're my father, they're my brothers, they're my sisters. Wow. Wow. And this parable has such deep, deep meaning. I, I brought the, the little book here. Um, I had just uh, started reading through it again, the book of education. And uh, chapter 11, if you go home this, this afternoon and you just want to, you know, get a little more insight into this parable, it's called Lessons of Life. And it starts on page 102. And it's just loaded. It's just loaded. I mean, we could be here for hours talking about this parable. I'm not kidding you. But here he is. Get, gets on this boat. Getting, getting his balance. And then he just lets us have it. The great controversy. So here they are. They're like wayside hearers. They're, they're you know, all there. All the different hearers. All the different hearers are there. Okay? So keep that in mind. So you've got this great controversy between Christ and Satan. The light and the darkness. And it's presented before us in this parable. I never looked at it that way before. The great controversy in the parable of the sower? Oh, come on. A great multitude had gathered to hear the words of Christ so that he was so thronged upon all sides. And in order that the people might better see and hear him, he stepped into a boat and pushed off a little from the shore. In plain sight were the sowers and the reapers. So here's all the great multitude. And then as he looks beyond the great multitude, what does he see going on? That time of year, I guess, they were sowing. The sowers are out there spreading that seed. Okay? One casting the seed, the other harvesting the early grain off in another distance there. So you can kind of picture that in your mind. Calling the attention of the people to the scene before him, he utters the parable that is to teach the lesson, lesson of life. It's lessons for all of us. Okay? On the reception and the rejection of his word, the gospel, his word, the truth, all the way to the end of probation. Okay? So here is a sower. And you visualize it. Beautiful scene. And how appropriate. At that time, the sowers were sowing as he's teaching about sowing. Wow. I mean, talk about a God who's in control. <laughs> the sower sows the word. Christ came to sow the world with truth. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been sowing seeds of error. He was by a lie, it was by the lie, that he first gained control over men. And thus, he still works to overthrow God's kingdom in the earth and to bring men under his power. A sower from a higher world, Christ, came to sow seeds of truth. He who had stood in the councils of God, who had dwelt in the innermost sanctuary of the Most High, you know, the eternal, could bring to men the pure principles of truth. Ever since the fall of man, Christ has been the revealer of truth to the world. By him, the incorruptible seed. I like that. The incorruptible seed. The word of God, which lives and abides forever, is communicated to men. Wow. What a privilege. What a blessing. And, you know, if you go online, you can get all kinds of portrayals of this parable. I mean, there's, there's multitudes of them. I picked out a few of them to, you know, review again of the four types of soil. You, they said that you got the pathway, you got the rocky soil, you got the thorny, you got the good soil. And then what's happening, it, it kind of gives you a little picture in there. And you got the trampling and the birds coming along to destroy the pathway seed. You've got the, the roots not grounded or rooted, the sun scorching away. You got the rocky soil, the choking and the suffocation in the thorny soil, and then you've got, man, you got the good soil, which I love. 
is where you grow up, you increase, and you yield, and are very fruitful. Very fruitful. Another one, somebody kind of took it, says, well, you know, what you really see there in the parable of the sower is, is faith. The different, four different types of faith. And I said, oh, yeah, they got something there. You got the faith blinders, you know. They only can see so far, and then that's it. You got the rocky faith. You've got the rebel faith. And you got the faith that remains, that's faithful, that's always there, never gives up on you. And then you got this one. I thought, well, this one really went into it. it you got the sower, you got the message, and you've got the different hearers and what you got number one, number two, number three up there at the top, and number four at the top. You know, they, they're not really, you know, taking it to heart. It's not really finding, you know, enough to hold on to there in your heart. The evil one comes and snatches it away. And the, the number five and six and seven, wow. I mean, got any worry warts out there? I tend to be one. And the Lord's working on me on that. But worry, wealth, persecution, all those things that kind of bombard us day in and day out can wear us down to the point where it's just not sticking. It's not happening. And then you finally have got the, uh, the, the deceitfulness, the things that kind of choke, choke things out and uh, does a number on you very quickly. So finally what we want to see is the yielding and the fruitfulness that God, the power of God which is living and active can do for our, for our hearts. One more, harvest. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. You've got the hardened path, no understanding. You've got the rocky ground, no roots. You've got the thorny ground, no fruit. And you've got the good soil, fruitful Christians. That's what we all want to be, is fruitful Christians. So this was very, very simply you know, laid out by the Lord himself. And I like this last illustration, four kinds of heart. You know, you can almost tell a, a person's heart by looking at their eyes. Did you know that? There's a statement that says that the eyes are a window to the yeah, the soul, the body. So if, you, if you're confronted with a person that has this you know, look on his face or her face, wow, you can say, uh-oh, oh, something's going on. If you've got somebody that's just kind of dull and out of it and just not with it, so, you know, just overwhelmed, then you know what soil they're dealing with. And then you've got the one where like, oh, you know, i just overwhelmed here. I'm just stressing out. I'm just worried. I'm just, you know, out of it. And then finally you've got that smiling, glowing, beaming, happy, <laughs> loving, joyful Christian. Which, that's what the Lord would like us all to become and stay. So I said, all right, now, what more insight can we gather, if anything, from the spirit of prophecy? Does she even use the term garden of the heart? Guess what? Yes, she does. The parable of the sower and the seed conveys a deep spiritual lesson. It goes right to the heart. The seed represents the principles of God's word sown in the heart. Now, if you were to go into God's word and go to the Hebrew and the Greek, which I did to, with several of the texts, lo and behold, heart really means what? Our minds. So they're kind of together. They're simultaneously, you know, one and the same thing. I said, okay. So whenever I say heart, you need to also think your entire being, your mind, all that you are. And, it, and it's growth and development of character. And, and, and we know that we're all still here because we're all still forming characters. Characters like his. The garden must be prepared for the natural seed. So the heart and the mind must be prepared for the seed of truth. You don't think of that that much. You just think, okay, let it come. Come on, hit me with it. Hit me. No. 
got to prepare the soil, which I had to do when I was putting those new plants in this last week. I had to get in there and dig up the soil and move it around and get some additives put in there, some, you know, and cultivate it and work with it and get it light and fluffy and boom, we're ready. It must be prepared. As the plant grows, the correspondence between the natural and the spirit sowing can be continued. Wow. And she said, he says, she says, you know, in the first Corinthians 3 9, it says, Ye, you are God's husbandry. Husbandry is another form word for garden. He's a gardener, okay? So as one takes pleasure in the cultivation of a garden, so God takes pleasure in his believing sons and daughters. A garden demands constant labor. The weeds must be removed. Oops. Weeds? Weeds in my heart? No. No way. New plants, it says, must be set out. Branches that are making too rapid development must be pruned back so that the wor Lord's works for his garden, it, and it says, so he tends his plants. So the, he works kind of that way with us. So whenever you're outside working away, just be reminded that he's working on your heart as you're working outside with your own plants and trees and so forth. So she stresses the garden of the heart needs cultivating. What's, what does cultivate mean? Till, you know, uh, develop or improve. You're trying to improve things. When I went into Spirit Prophecy, she so many it would be a, a list mile long she says you need to cultivate this and cultivate and cultivate and cultivate and cultivate and cultivate I go wow there's a lot of cultivating but without the Lord's power and help we can't do it do it right it says from the tilling of the soil lessons may be constantly learned no one settles upon a raw piece of land with the expectation that it will at once yield a harvest Diligent, persevering labor must be put forth in the preparation of the soil, the sowing of the seed, the, cu the culture of the crop. So it must be in the spiritual sowing. The garden of the heart, there it is, must be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by what? Repentance. And you know, when you go through the Word of God, that word just keeps popping up popping up, shouting out at us, repent, repent, repent. It's an important, important thing. And repentance really means what? Sorry. I'm sorry. Got that sorrowful heart. Sorry enough to quit doing it the wrong way and do it the right way. The evil uh, growths that choke the good grain must be uprooted. I was out weeding yesterday as I was mowing my lawn. As soil once overgrown with thorns can be reclaimed only by diligent labor, so the evil tendencies of the heart can be overcome only by the earnest effort in the name and strength of who? Jesus Christ, our gardener. Teach your children that the garden in which they place the tiny seed represents the garden of the heart. So we should be teaching our children as we're out there working with flowers and trees and gardening and so forth. And you have children or children close by. Hey, use it as a spiritual lesson that God has enjoined upon you, their parents, to cultivate the soil of their hearts and minds as they cultivate the garden. The Lord has entrusted to parents a solemn, sacred work. They are to cultivate carefully the soil of the heart the mind. Thus they may be labors together with God. He expects them to guard and tend carefully the garden of their children's hearts and minds. They are to sow the good seed, weeding out every unsightly weed, every defect in character, every fault in disposition. Needs to be cut away, for if allowed to remain, these mar the beauty of the character. So what is God's ultimate focus and concern is our characters. Our characters. Formation. The proper formation. Precious plants. He cannot take pleasure in any development that does not reveal the characters of who? 
Christ. So really, ultimately, it's Christ's character that's the focus. That's what we want. The blood of Christ has made men and women God's precious charge. Then how careful should we be not to manifest too much freedom. Get this now. I like this when she says Too much freedom in pulling up the plants that God has placed in his garden. Uh oh. Wow. Some plants are so feeble that they have hardly any life. And for these, the Lord has a special care. A special care. So, all of us are considered his what? His plants. You ever look at yourself as a plant? <laughs> but in his eyes, we, we're in that process of developing and growing like a plant does. It's amazing. In all your transactions with your fellow man, never forget that you are dealing with God's property. Be kind. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Respect God's purchased possession. Treat one another with tenderness and courtesy. Exert every God-given faculty to become examples to others. Examples of Christ. Let him who knows the heart and all its waywardness be able to deal with you in mercy because you have shown mercy and compassion and love. That's what it's all about, Lord. A loving, kind heart. Seeds of God's word. Philippians and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So his word is powerful enough to do that. To give you a peaceful heart. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. 